Hey, what's up guys? I wanted to switch it up a little bit here and read the introduction or part of the introduction from a book that's a little bit different than what I've been reading through. The book I'm going to be um, reading through and the author introducing is Manuel Delanda. He wrote a book called The A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History. He was writing in the um, spirit of French philosopher Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, but more Gilles Deleuze, um, who is a fascinating author. Um, and he takes a lot of his understandings and ideas and kind of actualizes them into uh, the history of different systems from civilization to biological, um, biological organisms, uh, cities, countries. It's really uh, placed to the fractal reality of, of, uh, of the world that we live in. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit of the introduction here and see how it goes. So here, I'll just give you a quick uh, understanding of the contents, right? So after the introduction, the first section is entitled Lavas and Magmas. First subsection is gene uh, gele Geological History, uh, 1000 to 1700 AD. Sandstone and Granite, Geological History, 1700 to 2000 AD. Second section of the book is Flesh and Genes, Biological History, Species and Ecosystems, Biological History. And the third section is entitled Memes and Norms, Linguistic History, Arguments and Operators, Linguistic History, 1700 to 2000 AD. And there's a conclusion. Um, this was published initially in 2000, uh, I think actually 1997, republished in 2011. If you want to look up Manuel Delanda, uh, EGS, European Graduate School on YouTube, you can get a lot into his videos and um, kind of see what he's about. Fascinating, fascinating um, philosopher of so here we go, introduction. Despite its title, this is not a book of history, but a book of philosophy. It is, however, a deeply historical philosophy which holds as its central thesis that all structures that surround us and form our reality, mountains, animals, and plants, human languages, social institutions, are the products of specific historical processes. To be consistent, this type of philosophy must, uh, must of necessity take real history as its starting point. The problem is, of course, that those who wrote history, however, scholarly, do so from a given philosophical point of view, and this would seem to trap us in a vicious circle. But just as history and philosophy may interact in such a way as to make an objective assessment of reality impossible, when entrenched worldviews and routine procedures for gathering historical evidence constrain each other negatively, they can also interact positively and turn this mutual dependence into a virtuous circle. Moreover, it may be argued that this positive interaction has already begun. Many historians have abandoned their Eurocentric and now question Eurocentrism and now question the very rise of the West. Why not China or Islam is now a common question. And some have even left behind their anthropocentrism and include a host of non-human histories in their account. A number of philosophers, for their part, have benefited from the new historical evidence that scholars such as Ferdinand Brodel and William McNeil have unearthed and have used it as a point of departure for a new, revived sort of materialism liberated from the dogmas of the past. Philosophy is not, however, the only discipline that has been influenced by a new, my, by a new awareness of the role of historical processes. Science, too, has acquired a historical consciousness. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the last two or three decades, history has infiltrated physics, chemistry, and biology. It is true that 19th century thermodynamics had already introduced time's arrow into physics, and hence the idea of the irreversible historical process. And the theory of evolution had, of evolution had already shown that animals and plants were not embodiments of internal essences, but piecemeal historical constructs, constructions, slow accumulations of adapt adaptive traits, cemented together via reproductive isolation. However, the classical versions of these two theories incorporated a rather weak notion of history into their conceptual machinery. Both classical thermodynamics and Darwinism admitted only one possible historical outcome, the reaching of thermal equilibrium or of the fittest design. In both cases, once this point is reached, historical processes ceased to count. In a sense, optimal design or optimal distribution of energy represented an end to history for these theories. It should come as no surprise then the current presentation, uh, penetration of science by historical concerns has been the result of advances in these two disciplines. Ilya Prigogine revolutionized thermodynamics in the 1960s by showing that the classical results were valid only for those closed systems where the overall quantities of energy are always conserved. 
If one allows an intense flow of energy in and out of a system, that is, if one pushes it far from equilibrium, the number and type of possible historical outcomes greatly increases. Instead of a unique and simple form of stability, we now have multiple coexisting forms of varying complexity, static, periodic, and chaotic attractors. Moreover, when a system switches from one stable state to another, at a critical point called a bifurcation, minor fluctuations play a crucial role in deciding the outcome. Thus, when we study a given physical system, we need to know the specific nature of the fluctuations that have been present, that have been present at each of these bifurcations. In other words, we need to know its history and understand its current dynamical state. And what is the true, uh, and what is true of physical systems is all the more true of biological ones. Attractors and bifurcations are features of any system in which the dynamics are not only far from equilibrium, but also nonlinear. That is, in which there are strong mutual interactions or feedback between components. Whether the system in question is composed of molecules or of living creatures, it will exhibit endogenously generated stable states, as well as sharp transitions between states, as, um, as long as there is feedback and an intense flow of energy coursing through the system. As biology begins to include these nonlinear dynamical phenomena in its models, for example, the mutual stimulation involved in the case of evolutionary arms races between predators and prey, the notion of a fittest design will lose its meaning. In an arms race, there is no optimal solution fixed once and for all since the creation of fitness itself changes with the dynamics. As the belief in a fixed criterion of, optimally dis of op optimality disappears from biology, real historical processes come to reassert themselves once more. Thus, the move away from energetic equilibrium and linear causality has re-injected the natural science with historical concerns. This book is an exploration of the possibilities that might be opened to philosophical reflection by a similar move in the social sciences in general and, hist in, uh, in general and history in particular. These pages explore the possibilities of a nonlinear and non-equilibrium history by tracing the development of the West in three historical narratives, each starting roughly in the year 1000 and culminating in our own time, a thousand years later. But doesn't that, this approach contradict my stated goal? Isn't the very idea of following a line of development century by century inherently linear? My answer is that a nonlinear conception of history has absolutely nothing to do with the style of presentation, as if one could truly capture the non-equilibrium dynamics of a human historical process by jumping back and forth among centuries. On the contrary, what is needed here is not a textual but a physical operation. Much as history has infiltrated physics, we now must allow physics to infiltrate human history. Earlier attempts at this direction, most notably the pioneering work of the physicist Arthur Ibrill, uh, offer a useful illustration on the conceptual shifts that this infiltration would involve. Iberol was perhaps the first to visualize the major transitions in early human history, the transitions from hunter-gatherer to agriculturist, and from agriculturist to city-dweller, not as a linear advance up the ladder of progress, but as the crossing of a nonlinear critical threshold, which are bifurcations. More specifically, much as a given chemical compound, water, for example, may exist in several distinct states, solid, liquid, or gas, and may switch from sta stable state to stable state at critical points in the intensity of temperature called phase transitions. So a human society may be seen as a material capable of undergoing these changes of state as it reaches critical mass in terms of density of settlement, amount of energy consumed, or even intensity of interaction. Eberall, uh, Eberall invites us to a new early hunter-gatherer bands as gas particles. Wait, Eberall invites us to view early hunter-gatherer bands as gas particles, in the sense that they lived apart from each other and the, uh, each other, and therefore interacted rarely and unsystematically. Based on the ethnographic evidence that bands typically li typically lived about 70 miles apart and assumed that humans can walk about 25 miles a day, he calculates that any two bands were separated by more than a day's distance from one another. When humans first began to cultivate cereals and the interaction between human beings and plants created sedentary communities, human humanity liquefied or condensed into groups whose interactions were now more frequent, although still loosely regulated. Finally, when a few of these communities intensified agricultural production to the point where surplus could be harvested, stored, and redistributed, for the first time allowing a division of labor between producers and consumers of food, humanity acquired a critical state in the sense that central governments now imposed a systematic, systematical grid of laws and regulations on the urban populations.
However o- oversimplified this picture may be, it contains a significant clue as to the nature of nonlinear history. If the different stages of human history were indeed brought about by phase transitions, then they are not stages at all. That is, progressive developmental steps, each better uh, than the previous one, and indeed leaving the previous one behind. On the contrary, much as water is solid, liquid, and gas phases may coexist, so each new human phase simply added itself to the other ones, coexisting and interacting with them without leaving them in the, uh, in the past. I'm getting a phone call here. Um, Moreover, much as a given material may solidify in alternate ways, as ice or snowflake or crystal or glass, so humanity liquefied and later solidified in different forms. The nomads of the steppes, the Huns and the Mongols, for example, domesticated animals, not plants, and the consequent pastoral lifestyle imposed on them the need to move with their flocks, almost as if they had condensed into into, into a pool of liquid, but into a moving... It, not into a pool of liquid, but into a moving, at times turbulent, fluid. When these nomads did acquire a solid state during the reign of Genghis Khan, for instance, the resulting structure was more like glass than crystal, for amorphous and less, far more amorphous and less centralized. In other words, human history did not follow a straight line, as if everything pointed towards civilized societies as humanity's ultimate goal. On the contrary, at each bifurcation, alternate stable states were possible, and once actualized, they coexisted and interacted with one another. I'm aware that all we have suggested here are metaphors. It is the task of the various chapters of this book to attempt to remove the metaphorical content. Moreover, even as metaphors, Iberal's Images suffer from another drawback. Inorganic matter energy has a wider, ma- wider range of alternatives for the generation of structure than just these simple phase transitions. And what is true for simple stuff must be all the more so for the complex materials that form human cultures. In other words, even the, the humblest forms of matter and energy have the potential for self-organization beyond the relatively simple type involved in creation of crystals. There are, for instance, those coherent waves called solutions, which form in many different types of materials, ranging from ocean waters, where they are called tsunamis, to lasers. Then there are the aforementioned stable states, or attractors, which can sustain coherent cyclical activity of different types, periodic or chaotic. Finally, and unlike the previous examples of nonlinear self-organization, where true innovation cannot occur, there is what we may call nonlinear combinatorics which explores the different combinations into which entities derived from the previous processes, crystals, coherent pulses, cyclical patterns, may enter. It is from these unlimited combinations that truly novel structures are generated. When put together, all these forms of spontaneous structural generation suggest that inorganic matter is much more variable and creative than we ever imagined. And this insight into matter's inherent creativity needs to be fully incorporated into our new materialist philosophies. All right, that's just a portion of the introduction I get from Manuel Delanda, uh, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History. Nonlinear history. Um, this book influenced uh, Jordan Hall, used to go by Jordan Green Hall. He's had a lot of conversations with Jonathan Pajot, um, John Verveke about the meaning crisis. And it kind of goes hand in hand of where we're at currently here in 2020, June 2020, as we seem to be going through one of these bifurcations or one of these shifts um, from a way of being and in the world to a new way of being in the world. Uh, we're going for more physical cities to more virtual uh, spaces, uh, interactions through uh, Zoom and, and online. Um, and that could go uh, many different ways. Um, but I just wanted to give a, a quick introduction here. Let me know if you guys like that or what you guys think. Um, and thanks for listening.